Hey, this is a wrap-up video or, well, I don't know how to categorize it actually. Is it a wrap-up of my reading or is it a wrap-up? It's more of a wrap-up of my appreciation of Sumerian September, I think. The event created by Michael K. Vaughn to celebrate Conan the Barbarian and contributed to by some of the big booktubers. The, the theme this year that Michael K. Vaughan set up, he set it up so you could read any Conan you wanted, uh, but the, the actual theme he promoted was pastiche fiction. Plenty of Conan pastiche novels, probably more than anything outside of uh, Star Wars and Star Trek. There's probably more Conan milieu uh, fiction by other hands than any other franchise that I can think of. I don't know. There might have been a lot of Buffy novels in the day, or there might have been a lot of, uh, you know, Battlestar, not Battlestar Galactica, might, um, what was the one, uh, Babylon 5, you know, a, a lot of different series and different uh, franchises, especially in science fiction and or gaming fantasy, like the Dragonlance books, the D&D kind of novels and things, have gone through different periods of movie tie-ins or media tie-ins. Uh, a lot of them, you know, kind of peter out after the series. Conan's the only uh, is one that, you know, Star Wars and and to nearly the same extent, Star Wars have always been around consistently since, the, since they ramped up in the 70s. They might, you know, there's probably not as many Star Trek books as there were at one time, but there are novels coming out about more recent series. Um... Star Wars seems to be consistently pumped out constantly. Conan kind of comes and goes in prestige friction. There was a lot in the, I want to say the 90s, I guess, maybe a little earlier. There's Robert Jordan, uh, Roland Green, uh, period, ton of those. Uh, Stephen, Steve Donahue's been, been talking about some of those uh, in good uh, things. But the main thing was to read the, the, the camp the Elsberg de Camp edited series from the, I guess, 70s. It might have started in the early 60s. The, basically, the first concerted reissue of the Conan stories in an organized form as a series and introduced many people to the character and many people like me who first learned about Conan from the comic books. Um, I don't know offhand whether what started first, the DeCamp Carter series or the comic books. Probably about the same time as part of, probably the same sort of general Conan revival. Or I'm not even sure you can say revival. The, the first popular wave of Conan, because before then he had been mostly kept alive by Gnome Press, you know, which is which is small press dedicated to preserving the legacy of the great uh, Weird Tales writers like H.P. Lovecraft and Howard. And they were specialty books. Gnome Press, I believe they were expensive books at the time. And it was a small press for sure. Um, but they kept the legacy of these great pulp writers alive and, and of course people you know collected and traded uh, the old uh, you know, back issues of weird tales and, and wrote fanzines and stuff like that but it was more of an obscure thing and it kind of blew into the culture with the Roy Thomas the Marvel comic book these El Sprague de Camp books and then of course you know all cum culminating in the movie which we when I was in high school, we talked about for years before it came out. Everybody knew that Schwarzenegger was eventually going to make a comic book, was eventually supposed to make a, a Conan movie. It seemed like four or five years people talked about it. You know, he seemed like the perfect person to do it, a big muscle guy, uh, Germanic background, probably didn't need to be a good actor, although, you know, Schwarzenegger, I would argue, I think most people would agree now did become a good actor, but he didn't start out as a very good actor. Um, so I really enjoyed, so this is, 
I, I, you could call this more of a reaction to, to Sumerian September. And the videos I watched of it, rather than reading, because I only read one Conan Pastiche novel. That's all I ended up reading was Conan the Liberator by Elspreg de Camp and Lynn Carter, which is not, and I talked about it before, it's not one of the 12 original uh, books that, that Elspreg de Camp put together. It was a further cash grab. It was one of three novels I think they wrote after that. And I watched a lot of videos by uh, Steve Donahue, by Michael K. Vaughan, by Grammaticus, and by uh, Jim at Mystery and Mayhem were the, were, the other, were the Howard videos I watched this month. And I enjoyed them all immensely. And I enjoyed thinking about this issue because... I'm about the same age as most of these guys. I'm a little older than a couple of these guys, but um, you know, we all kind of came from the background. I'm not sure about Jim so much. He might have had uh, a different introduction to them. I really don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, Jim. I don't know um, what your introduction to this was, but at least it seems Stephen K. Vaughan, Michael K. Vaughan, I'm merging the two greatest booktubers into one person, Stephen K. Vaughan, no, Michael K. Vaughan seemed to be introduced to these characters in, in to this character in print from the the Camp and Carter books, as I was, even though I'm older than him. Uh, like I say, I read the comic first, and it, my sort of trajectory was I was a big comic book fan and a reader. I started reading the Joe Cooper's uh, DC Tarzan adaptions which led me to the Edgar S. Burroughs novels, what I could find of them. They were kind of sketchy. Everything was hard to find in those days in Nevada. You know, you just, in Reno, Nevada, we had a couple of bookstores, but they were just, you know, it's not like today where you could just get every book um, in the world, even if they were in print. And from there, looking for similar things, I found that the Conan, the Roy Thomas Conan book a little later on, I was very brand. I was very brand snobbish. I only read DC when I was young, like a lot of people, and switched over to Marvel uh, when I I tried uh, one Marvel book. Might have been Conan. Might have been. I just have to try this now, and I and I totally switched brand loyalty to Marvel for a while. Uh, so those were Thomas edition uh, stories were fantastic. Barry Smith. Then later, John Buscema. That was my introduction. And then, of course, you know, as with the Burroughs, the DC Burroughs books, the ancillary material in the Conan comics would talk about the original authors. They were very good like that in the 70s, you know, the on the letters page or the editorial page that would come accompanying the letters page sometimes. You know, they would talk about the original stories and adaptions, and I learned about Red Sonia being uh, adapted from a non-Conan story by Roy Thomas into a Conan story. So when I came, when I discovered the print books, the the series of, of a dozen books, where they took the original 18 Robert Howard stories, plus a few unpublished ones, plus a few fragments, plus just stuff they crammed in there, Elspreg de Camp particularly, but with the help of Lynn Carter and another guy, Bjorn Nyberg, who really didn't have that much to do, I don't think, except later in the series. And sort of rigged them up into a continuity and added their own chapters in between. I did not think anything of it. I just thought, you know, that's how, that's how grown-ups do stuff. And that's what I appreciate so much about this this event, this month-long event, uh, Michael's event, and the commentary I've re heard from other people that I've already mentioned, and I'll link to all their channels. Um, it really prompted me to rethink all this because I did it, and I think a lot of people did, especially when we, who were teenagers when they saw these, really didn't think anything of it e either way. I, I personally very judge, judge non-judgmentally I remember particularly one story striking me as very stupid. I think it's the earliest story 
by DeCamp and Carter where, where Conan, a young teenage Conan or preteen Conan finds a magic sword of some kind and uh, seems to set him on his path and I thought like, well, Conan doesn't really have a, a special sword. It's, you know, doesn't really come up in the stories. He's He's not like Elric, he doesn't have a sword like Stormbringer. He's not like uh, King Arthur and the Sword in the Stone or anything like. That. Well, actually, he, and King, not the Sword in the Stone, but King Arthur and Excalibur, and all that. It seemed to seemed to be kind of trying to sort of cram Conan into a different sort of aesthetic, which became really a big part of it. I don't know how much. I'm going to have to read all these stories again. I'm going to have to read the Hyborian Age, the Hyperborean Age. I think it's, no, I think it's Hyborian Age. I don't ever remember. The essay by Howard again, his whole history. Because you get, and particularly even with the movie where they had Schwarzenegger in a scene, you know, made up to be old Conan, King Conan. Um, and there's this kind of hint of destiny about this man going through all these trials to one day be king of the greatest civilization. I don't know, and people can people let me know in the comments if you're seeing this. I don't know why I'm addressing you if you're not seeing this. Uh, whether they think that was Howard's intention, because of the way the stories were written out of order, I really just see Conan as a king as being just a different phase of his life, not his final destiny. But anyway, it seemed like those 12 books were sort of organized way to make it a, a very specific destiny, uh, you know, Arthurian kind of uh, saga or, you know, T Tolkien-esque kind of thing in, in a weird way that, that was trying, if you'll tend to graft on to uh, Robert E. Howard's adventure tales. But I could be wrong. Maybe he did really want people to come away with the feeling of this that Conan was a man of destiny. I just thought of it as a, a per, the character Conan, which is why I like the character so much, as a person who went through many different phases in their life and had many different careers. Kind of rose to the top of everything he did because he's a heroic character. I mean, you know, he became a thief and he was the greatest thief he was a he was a mercenary and he was the greatest mercenary and he was a later a, a military leader and he was the greatest at that and he was a, a, a great king just seems like uh, natural that he would excel at, at whatever he wanted to put his mind to because that's the kind of character it is but not that he was like blessed like in, uh, in any sort of magical way he seemed to be to me to be the anecdote, anecdote to the antidote to magic, the, the antidote to sort of myth making, if that makes sense. He was anti mythological, is what I always took away from the character. And if you asked me a month ago, even what my favorite sword and sorcery was, I would probably not put Conan at the top. I would definitely put Fafford and the Great Mauser at the top. I still think probably Fritz Leiber is probably a better writer overall. There's really no reason to compare them, though, but his stories are very similar. I would say if I would say the really good sword and sorcery is Michael Moorcock, especially Elric, but also Coram and some of his other characters, and Fritz Leiber is Fafford and the Great Mauser. And I, I stand by that, but, you know, obviously they were both very influenced by Conan. I don't think those stories would exist. Certainly not in the same way, um, even though um, Fritz Leiber, I think, wrote the first Fafford and Mauser story pretty early, in the 30s. Um, although he had set it in... Leiber set his first Fafford and Grey Mauser story in recorded history. I don't remember what the era was offhand. It's the only story that set that in recorded history. Then later, when he went back to it and created a series, he put them in, you know, his own fantasy prehistory, like like the Conan stories are, are done in. So he could have been influenced by that, or it might have just been parallel thinking. And of course, Moorcock, very knowledgeable about 
Pulp Fiction. You know, he was an editor of a couple of uh, successful science fiction magazines in Britain in in his early teens when he started when he started writing. He he edited a magazine called I think it was called Tars and Adventures and. He had a New World magazine, which was uh, more experimental. And so he was very knowledgeable on the Popes. And he wrote Burroughs Pastiches. He wrote his own Mars trilogy, which are straight up Burroughs Pastiches, which are they're kind of fun. I believe his quote is, it took him all of a week to write the three books. Um, and he didn't really go back to those Burroughs Pastiches, but he, he's still doing Elric stuff. I mean... You know, as recently as just a few years ago. And those books are amazing. Elric, that is an amazing character. And that is a character with a kind of destiny. Very, you can see where he's kind of uh, an anti-Conan, you know, where where Conan's a barbarian um, from the northern wastes with no pedigree at all, just a tribesman. Uh, with very little back history, you know they they put stuff in the movie and and the camp and Carter added a bunch of stuff which just diminishes the character, makes him. Uh... But you know Elric is you know just the exact mirror image as far as you could get from Conan being he's you know. He's very thin and pale and eff- effeminate, even and uh, probably the best play- person to play Elric in a movie would be Tilda Swinton and play him as a man, but just have a woman play him. But if they ever did an Elric movie, which they could not do without fucking up at all, there's just no way they can not fuck up an Elric movie. That will never happen. I guarantee that if they ever make an Elric movie, it'll be terrible. Um, because they're not going to have the respect for the material. Uh, anyway, and you know, and Elric was was a, was a from a, a long line of of royalty and the last of a dying kingdom and very decadent and stuff. So, you can see where uh, Michael Marcock made a character almost co- maybe consciously, I would I would imagine consciously to make it as anti Conan as possible and yet still be a swordsman out roaming adventures at novel novelette length. And they're fantastic stories. It's so such good writing, and but so are the Conan stories. And what I what this month made me realize, and why I'm making this video now is, in a way, and it never occurred to me those what L. Sprague de Camp did and Lynn Carter did was extremely diminishing, because I read those books and I thought they were okay. Some of the stories were good. Some of them were not good. Had I just gone through and read the Howard stories only, I think I would have had a much, much, much higher opinion of Conan as a character. So did they do more bad than good? I don't know, because that was the publishing at the time. Uh, That was the way it was done. It would make more sense today that they would just put all the Conan stories in a couple volumes like they like they are printed now and then do some other adventures outside of it. But to have the Conan, the Howard stuff by itself alone presented first and then just throw all the junk after it like this is what they do now. And if, if a lot of these Conan, the tour novels from the 90s or whenever they were, the Robert Jordan ones and Roland Green and, and all those people and Andrew Offit, Carl Wagner. I mean, there was good people writing some of them. I'm sure Carl, I can't find it, uh, but Carl Wagner's uh, Conan book is probably awesome because he was a great writer. So a few, I, but I read those, uh, those first 12 and found them a very mixed bag. The name Conan was so popular back then. There was, in fact, four of the stories, four of the, the Sprague Carter originals, I'm not sure which book they make up, appeared kind of for promotional purposes. They appeared as, as stories in individual stories in fantastic stories back in the 70s there was a few more magazines like today we have there's a few digests less left uh like 
Asimov's science fiction and analog science fiction. Those are basically the only two digests left. At this time, there was also, in the 70s, there was also Amazing and Fantastic, which were magazines that had been around for a long time. They were When I was reading them, they were edited by Ted White, who's still around and retired from whatever non-writing, uh, non-editing career he had, and he's now... Uh, writing and publishing stories again. Before that, Barry Malzberg had been editor for a couple of years, but they were they were a step below Analog and Asimov and Galaxy was still being published at the time. Um, and Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, of course, is the other one I forgot to mention. But there was also Amazing and Fantastic, which alternated, which were both edited by the same person, Ted White, and which alternated issues month by month. And the only place they sold them was in this that I knew of was in this really scummy, uh, tiny grocery store near my high school. Uh, it's the only place that had them, and I was grateful that they had them there, so I could buy them. And they were very cheaply printed. That you know, you would open them up; they would practically the pages would practically fall out. They were about half the size of analog. They're about a hundred pages each, but they contained really good stories and the. And I, I like them, and I liked Ted White's editorials, where he was very honest about the miserable state of, of science fiction publishing. You know, imagine how much worse those editorials would be today. But uh, for a while, for about four issues, which is almost a year since they alternated uh, uh, six, so there were six issues of Fantastic a year, they would publish these Conan stories by excerpted from that series from by Elspeth de Camp and Carter, the original ones, not the Howard ones. And they would always say, you know, the cover would always be fantastic, but above the cover would say, Conan, new story, de Camp and Carter. And I remember those really not thinking much of any of them, but I did remember from the editorial that Ted White said, you know, whenever we have a Conan story, it doubles the sales of any other issue of Amazing or Fantastic. So that's why they were printing these. Conan was the name. It wasn't Robert E. Howard. You know, they weren't putting uh, the name Robert E. Howard on the books, uh, on the magazine cover. Not that they could have, because they didn't have any... Howard was dead, obviously. And You know, so people didn't really care who wrote Conan, if whether it was Roy Thomas or Sprague in the camp. And so I think, in a way, it really did diminish... Conan's reputation as, for the want of a better word, literature, because his stories are fantastic. And that's, uh, his writing is fantastic. His world building, and I want to call uh, attention to, this probably got on long enough, but I really want to call attention to Grammaticus's video called Robert E. Howard and Race, I think is the name of it, or Conan and Race which when I saw the title, and the reason I want to, I want to bring it out specifically, because when I saw the title, I thought, oh boy, here we go. I, I've really had enough of uh, for this month about um, cancellation and stuff like that. So I misinterpreted what his point was. And it's a fantastic video about one part of Howard's, what we would call today, world building. And I really don't like that term because it feels so mechanical. But one element of one aspect of Howard's writing that made him such a rich and powerful writer when he was doing his best work. And of course, it wasn't all his best. You know, he wrote for the Spices, he wrote all kinds of stuff. You know, back then there was so much hunger for content that there was probably people were taking stuff just based on the name of a famous writer or just based on the fact that it fits some guidelines or, or stuff. And so there's a lot of Howard, that's you know second rate that probably wouldn't have been published if if there wasn't such a demand for just anything coherently genre like. But you know his best work is right up there with anybody writing in the in the time, and I just wonder what it, what it would have been different if those DeCamp and Carter stories didn't exist. So I I kind of feel, I think, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I, I kind of feel like Michael K. Vaughan is more along the same lines of feeling these 
books. These count these pastiches, this first wave of pastiches, you know, like this one, um, and this one, which Michael K. Vaughn's most recent uh, video was about about it being a terrible book. I think this is the one where I stopped reading. I know that I I did not read this book, but I read I skipped to the end because I knew it was the last book, and I wanted to see what they ended up doing with the character. That's how much. That's how boring I found these later Conan novels when they ran out of Howard material. Um, you know, and these first twelve books, they're they they the first nine books are are all Howard's material. Well, everything before Hour of the Dragon, which was the which they did as the tenth book, which is King Conan. And then the other two books, they just keep going on, so he just gets older and older. The f the tenth, the twelfth book, you know, introduces Dick Grayson, um, you know, in in the form of uh, Conan's son Con, and they go, K O or C O N N. He might have even been in the eleventh and twelfth books, but who cares? I didn't read them because, you know, he's the cousin Oliver of of sword and sorcery characters, where they decide, well, okay, Conan's gotten so old. Well, let's have a young character, and he'll be Conan's son, and they'll have adventures together, and nobody wants to read that shit. Nobody wants to read that shit. Nobody's ever liked sidekicks. Nobody's ever liked forcing a teenager into the uh, end of a series. Uh, you know, to, to, to appeal to the kids. So later they got the idea, you know... Instead of just thank God continuing with you know book thirteen, which Conan at eighty years old or something, instead of doing that, Carter DeCamp decided to just cash in by writing more prequels. You know that would go in the middle, like this one I tried to read a few years ago, um, Conan the Spider God, and that was terrible. And that I should have got a clue right then. This is the Elspeth DeCamp book that he wrote during one of those later eras after that first 12 book thing. It's just awful. It's just boring as hell. And this is Conan the Liberator is the one I read, the actual one I read for this for this uh, challenge, for this monthly challenge, which was Conan becoming king. Conan on his way to be king of Aquilonia, uh, which, as I mentioned before, has kind of a funny final chapter. Which is the odd thing because you know I used to really like Elspeth de Camp's work and I, his own work, his solo work. I don't remember. Probably I read his Conan stuff first, but I remember having the best of Elspeth de Camp, the, the anthology, and reading uh, his book, his sort of science fantasy book about a uh, uh, island in the Mediterranean, which is uh, all force fielded off so that some billionaire can have his own. Uh, society, which he, which he, he bases on ancient Rome, on the island, or ancient Athens, or someplace. It's been a long time since I read it. Was a very funny book, very funny, light book. But it, it's clear that he didn't really respect Howard. I, I really believe that now, after reflecting on the years. And Lynn Carter, just bless him, was just never a good writer. On, on any level, he wrote. He really loved writing his own pastiches of of different writers of Burroughs, especially and Conan a bit. He had a character called Thongor, Thongor of Atlantis. You know, and, and he wrote a he wrote a, a Doc Savage kind of parody at, at one point. He just and you know he. And clearly from his editorial work, you knew that he was very well read and he brought a lot of, uh, it was a, the Ban the Ballantine or Bantam adult fantasy series, which he edited and selected books for. And his name was big enough that he was featured as select, as, as the editor of this series, had the little unicorn logo on it uh, when they were bringing these classic fantasy books. Um, long out of print fantasy books like by A. Merritt and people like that and back into print kind of to cash in on Tolkien uh, but his own writing just was 
just not good. Uh, so they weren't the best people to be writing Conan. I kind of, again, I go back to uh, my my Star Trek reading where it seemed like a lot of the early writers were either just not, who did a lot of the early novels. I don't mean James Blish and that, but there was a few name authors who, who took work writing Star Trek books. I mean, professional established writers who took work writing Star Trek books that were just kind of treated it like a job and really sometimes obviously didn't really even have that much familiarity with the show. Then there were some fan writers who crossed over who kind of like, you know, were doing their own sort of fantasy trips on, on the characters and extrapolating from the very thin backstories that you got from a, 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 a three-season series of of a serial show on in the 1960s, which was not a lot, you know, and then you have today where you have these people who grew up on Star Trek and Star Trek books and they really take it seriously. And, and they, to them, it's, uh, to many of the people writing in later times, I mean, for the past probably 20, 30 years now, you know, take it as a legitimate, uh, uh, means of expression. But I think that for DeCamp and Carter, it was like, this is just a job. This is, you know, we've got this raw material here from this guy who's been dead for 30 years, which has some buzz around it. So let's let's uh, give the suckers what they want kind of thing. Um, maybe that's unfair. It just doesn't seem like Elspeg DeCamp gave a shit. And maybe as time went on, he became more resentful. I'm, I don't want to get. I shouldn't get too much into psychology. I started to talk about grammatics because this video where he talks about how uh, Conan uses race in a different way than we talk about it today. He used it in this very, you know, back in the time he was writing, you would talk about the Irish race or the Italian race or things like that. So it's very different we have today, and it's uh, really worth watching that video. Uh, you know, he's giving away basically. He he could get a he he. Could, he, could, he could get a master's degree or a doctorate out of his thoughts on that he puts into that video. If he wanted to do that, he'd get a master's of literature uh, by putting those, you know, by writing those thoughts out into a hundred-page paper. Instead, he decided to give them to us for free. So it's a very, it, it was a lot, of, a lot of food for thought in that. And I think there's other aspects of of uh, Howard's writing where he's just as good, he's just as rich as Steve Donahue says in one of his videos. When Howard was writing Conan, he knew he was writing, he knew he was creating his life's work. He was doing whatever you want to call it, whatever they call it now, like soul work. It's true, deep literature. It's what he was made to do. And I'm not saying he wouldn't have done more. I wish he would, had been around. I wish he had lived a full life. So we can see what else he would have done. I really felt like it seemed like at the time he was done with the Conan character. And uh, he had moved on to other kind of writing, more just more just straight commercial writing. I think he really wanted to work to do more westerns and things like that. And, but who knows what would have happened in thirty years? I'll get speculative here at the end. You know, it might have been like happened with Fritz Leiber, where there was this small group of Fafford and Mauser stories. People loved them so that in the 70s he started writing more of them. And he wrote some of the best ones years and years after the pulp era. And they were published in magazine and fantasy and science fiction, a couple of them, and some of them. And he won the Nebula Award for his origin story, Ill Met in Langmar, which, you know, he wrote. And this is like 30 years after he created the characters. He, wrote, he writes how they met and won a Nebula for it. And, uh, you know, got his own series of stories his own series, Fritz Leiber's own series of Fafford and Grey Mauser stories in order, numbered, with the stories reordered into chronological story in the lives of the characters as opposed to the time he writ them, written them. So you might, for example, in the first book you have a story from the 70s followed by a story from the 30s, or, you know, and, and then wrote a novel in between there, which is from the 60s and all this. So, who knows, if Howard had lived, he might have written his own 12-volume series in the late 60s. He might have written 
more Conan stories himself to fill in those gaps. He might have written another novel to wrap up the series or another novel of Conan's adventures on the way to becoming king. And, you know, and that's not to camp and Carter's fault that Howard killed himself, but we just don't know what would have happened, but we know what we have, which is these 18 fantastic stories. And I'll tell you one thing, probably the best re-experience of my, of my last, of this month of Conan, uh, Sumerian, Sumerian September was to read a Conan story after reading that horrible Conan the Liberator book. I read, um, I'm so bad with titles, I don't remember the one I read um, after that, but it is a similar military one, one of the original Conan stories. You go, oh my God, this is just such good, just such a release, at, release after reading that terrible pastiche. So, I came into the month very, being very neutral about DeCamp and Carter and thinking, oh, this will be fun. I'll read some of these old novels. And I came away thinking in general that it was not the best thing to happen. Maybe it was the only way it could have played out with the Conan revival, given the era it was in. You know, it's just a very strange thing to think of today, a, a writer being treated like that. Yet we treat our, our past writers in equally appalling ways, almost as appalling ways, like what they'd done to Road Dahl and, and uh, Ian Fleming, taking out the, the naughty bits and the sexist bits and the racist bits. You know, it's... So, you know, in our own way, we have our own uh, cross the bear when it, term, when it comes to handling our, our great literary leg legacy of, of how we approach it. You know, in the 19th century... They used to rewrite uh, Shakespeare to get happy endings to the tragedies. So, uh, so someone comes in at the last minute and gives an, an anecdote so that Romeo and Juliet can live, and Juliet can live, and and you know I'm sure that was quite an audience pleaser at the time, but I'm sure there was also people in the back room going, you know, that's not how that's not how Shakespeare wrote it, you know, but they didn't care because it was. You know they were they were trying to please the masses, um, but you know then again you know uh, that period passed and people thought uh, and people decided that's not the really the right right way to approach Shakespeare. We should do it. We should honor his text, and that's the way that they do with Howard now. They they honor his text. And maybe we'll get back to that too. I'm sure at some point they're going to come back. Somebody's going to come back with those Ian Flemings and those Road Dolls and Dr. Seuss and whatever else that they're balderizing now. And they're going to they're going to make a big show. And I guess the Burroughs Inc. is doing that too, uh, smoothing out some of the offensive stuff in Tarzan. But somebody's going to come out in a few decades and they're going to restore those and that'll be the next big thing they'll be the restored James Bond the original text texts the original Roald Dahl text the original uh, Matilda without all the PC uh, stuff and and it's it happened with Howard and so we're living in actually the greatest time where you can get all these stories you can even read Howard's fragments you can read his unpublished Conan stories, which are not as good. They're probably unpublished for a reason. You know, you can see his development as a writer. And that's all available to you. And most of it even for just 99 cents on Kindle. You don't have to get one of the big uh, corrected editions. You can get most of the, most of them, there's various copies. And it's all there for the taking. So who knows? It's just, the, it's just a very interesting part of literary history, of that Pulp Fiction history that this, this was allowed to happen, and it just points up uh, the thinking about Conan in that era versus today. And Howard, I guess my summing up would be to say that no matter what they tried to do to him, Howard survived it all. Howard and Conan survived it all, and they're still with us. Okay, so that's my thoughts on Sumerian September, and we'll talk about something else next time.